Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us this Friday afternoon. My name is Iris, and I will be one of your moderators for today's session. Joining me today is Simon Domingo from Plan International. Hello, everyone. Thank you for kicking us off, Iris. I'm happy to be co-moderating this session. So what are we talking about for today's session? Well, for today, our topic is going to be about engaging young citizens in accelerating a just transition for Asia Pacific. And we'll hear insights about this from different perspectives. That's great. I've been hearing the phrase just transition being thrown around lately. So it would be interesting to know how different people understand this concept. That's true. And we have experts today who come from different backgrounds who will share their own experiences and knowledge with us. Exactly. Personally, I think that young people are not only full of potential, but are already making concrete steps in the just transition. So it looks like we have a lot of people joining us today. How about we start? Who's first in line? Starting us off is the Regional Director from Plan International in Asia and the Pacific, Bagdashiri Dengri. Let's roll the tape. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone joining us. As we celebrate 20 years of collaboration between the ADB and the civil society organizations in this room, it is through our shared experiences, knowledge, and partnership that we are here today, continuing to ensure that nobody gets left behind as we transition into a greener tomorrow. Since 2019, PLAN has recognized that each and every person, particularly girls and young women, should be able to enjoy their full rights without being threatened or hindered by the chilling impacts of climate change. And yet time and time again, we are reminded that marginalized groups, especially girls and young women, are disproportionately affected and suffer the consequences of these unrelenting disasters the most. Worse, their right to participate is often violated as they are often forgotten, neglected and excluded from these very spaces where decisions are continuously made to decide on their future. The data is clear. While a just transition has negative impacts to society, it also serves as an opportunity to move forward in building a new society that is inclusive, sustainable and fair to all and not just some. This should inspire us to find ways to address this issue with the most affected in mind. Acknowledging that we don't have all the answers humbles and compels us all to look towards each other and have these conversations where we are able to bring together knowledge and the lived experiences of individuals from different walks of life, especially those who are often marginalized. It is clear that we need to change the way we work. We need to do better. We need to continue amplifying young people's voices and meaningfully engage them in spaces like this where we are today, which is why I'm overjoyed and excited to be sharing this platform with tenacious and dynamic youth who have been doing their part to ensure that nobody gets left behind as we move towards a future that we have built together so that their generation enjoys an inclusive and sustainable future that also empowers them to affect change in society at present. On behalf of the ADB and the civil society organizations joining us here today, we look forward to hearing all the fruitful discussions that we will be having. And as we listen to our speakers share their experiences and expertise, we may reflect on the work that we have done to contribute to this just transition with the human rights and gender perspectives in mind. Young people have been doing their part. How about us? Have we been doing enough? Thank, thank you and may we have a great session ahead. Thank you for your message, Bagyashri. Also here today is Director General and concurrently Chief Compliance Officer for the Sustainable Development and Climate Change Department, Bruno Carrasco, to share a few words of welcome. Thank you very much, Iris. Uh, a very warm welcome and good day to everyone. 
it's, uh, it's my great pleasure to join you alongside our key partner, Plan International, to share ideas on empowering young people in support of a just transition to greener economies. Uh, this event also marks a special occasion, and that is the 20-year anniversary of the establishment of the ADB's uh, NGO and Civil Society Center, or as we refer to it, NGOC. Engaging with civil society is key to our work at ADB. Against the backdrop of the many challenges facing our world today, I would like to highlight three principles on how we can continue to build and develop relationships with civil society to address these challenges. The first is awareness raising. Young people, of course, have much more at stake in terms of tomorrow's world and what the future looks like. How we discount the future is very different across generations. The clearest example of all is perhaps in climate change and how Greta and her generation have made it clear that business as usual is not on and how we must redouble our efforts to address climate change. The second collaboration. Joining forces in collaborating for shared goals is a very effective means to coalesce and transition from awareness raising into collective action to overcome these challenges. The third is transformation. Building on awareness raising and collaboration, we can change the way we work, engage with others in a more constructive manner and as emphasized by Bagashri, be more innovative in partnering and inclusion for all. Let me now highlight how we can put in practice these three principles in our partnership with uh, Plan International. First, on awareness raising, ADB, through the partnership with uh, Plan International, has worked extensively together to engage with young people across many different development projects through our Youth for Asia initiative. The early Asia-Pacific Youth Forum started in India in 2013, where ADB and PLAN brought young people together to learn and discuss development issues affecting the youth during the ADB's 46th annual meeting. It was the first time where young people participated in seminar discussions and engaged with ADB governments and civil society leaders. Today, we are partnering uh, to support young people to learn how they can locally lead in their community context to help accelerate the transition to greener economies. In this process, we are empowering young people to lead in dialogues and lead in the exploration of solutions to the climate challenge. Second, on collaboration, we realize that uh, collaborating with uh, new civil society groups and deepening the relationship uh, with current partners are on the agenda for ADB and NGOC. We are very much committed to keeping a close track of how civil society participates in ADB financed uh, projects and continue to identify and address the challenges to facilitating better working relationships. ADB through its NGOC work will continue to inform and extend support and capacity building to our staff developing member countries and civil society to work together in the operations. And finally, we hope that through stronger awareness and collaboration, ADB and civil society can mutually benefit from the process and gain more knowledge and understanding that will enable us to identify innovative solutions to address climate change and just transition. We believe there is an important role for young people uh, to play in this process in building a greener, more inclusive and resilient economy. I am delighted to see all of you joining the session, and I will wish all of you success uh, with this exciting discussion. You have an important role to play. I look forward to hearing the speakers' contributions to the climate change and just transition agenda. Thank you so much, DC Bruno, for those words. Looks like we're off to a great start, so let's keep the ball rolling. I agree. But hold on, for everyone watching, as we invite our experts to share their experiences and knowledge with us, we want you, the audience members, to join our conversations. You can ask your questions via Pigeonhole Live. Well, how do we do this, Iris? 
Or if you want to ask a question, you may access Pigeonhole Live by clicking the icon on the right of the live stream window or going to pigeonhole.at. Again, that is pigeonhole.at. Once you've accessed the website, please enter the passcode ADBMNL55 to start sharing your questions with us. Kindly to select our session, empowering youth to accelerate just transition to greener economies so that we'll be notified of your questions. For safeguarding purposes, there is an option to ask your questions anonymously. Keep in mind not to disclose any personal or identifiable information. And after that, you're all set. Towards the latter half of our session, Simon and I will be looking at your questions. So please make sure to include who you're addressing your question to, and our speakers will be more than happy to answer them later on. Amazing. Okay, I think we can start. I've been dying to know this, but what better way to start our discussion than getting to know how we understand the concept of a just transition? You're in luck, Simon, because our first speaker has the answers to this question. To kick us off, we'd like to invite Kate Hughes over to join us. Kate has 18 years of experience in climate change and sustainable development policy, financing, and technology projects across the Asia-Pacific region. As Senior Climate Change Specialist at ADB, Kate leads the development of the bank's institutional Just Transition Agenda, which supports countries in managing their Just Transition across all sectors as enablers of climate action. Welcome to the session, Kate, and thanks for joining us. Thanks, Simon. Thanks, Iris, and great to be here. Thanks for having me. Hi, Kate. We're so glad you're here. Before anything, would you mind helping us understand what just transition means and what's the current landscape like for the Asia-Pacific region? Absolutely. Um, you know, it's a phrase that's getting talked about a lot. Um, so happy to, to go back to basics and explain what it means. So fundamentally, just transition is about people. And it's about making sure that we consider them as part of planning and implementing climate action. So it's not focused on the impacts of climate change itself, but more on how the different activities and the different um, changes we need to make to deal with climate change can have impacts on people. So the term just transition was originally coined by union members as part of environmental movements in the US, but it became part of the climate policy landscape because of the concern around the sheer scale and pace of change that we need to make to address climate change and that this change can have potential negative impacts on people that really need to be anticipated and taken into account. And so the phrase just transition was included in the Paris Agreement and work around the topic has been growing since then. In, in the years since the Paris Agreement, I think how people perceive the topic of just transition and how we actually put it into action has evolved considerably, um, both within ADB but also externally. You know, for example, the initial focus was a lot around jobs um, which is still a critical part, but the agenda has expanded and now also considers other types of social and economic impacts, including you know, direct impacts, indirect impacts, but also induced impacts that we may see in the wider economy and society. It's also expanded to think about all different types of stakeholder groups, particularly vulnerable groups and youth, which you know, we're focused on today. Also, the original discussion was heavily focused on the energy sector, particularly coal mining, um, and that's, that's where a lot of the initial work on just transition has taken place. But as climate action has expanded and we take you know, a more whole of economy view now to the need to transform, as we talk about transformation to net zero, long-term resilience, um, then just transition similarly needs to take a whole of economy view. For ADB, there, there are a few fundamentals about how we approach just transition. 
Firstly, it is about impacts and mitigating um, potential risks or impacts, but it's also about opportunities and what type of positive interventions we can make early that can help societies, that can help youth take advantage of the opportunities that we see in a changing economy, um, in a changing landscape. Secondly, it's about fairness and inclusion, both as part of the process as well as part of the outcome. Um, and so you may hear, hear the terms procedural justice and distributional justice talked about in relation to just transition. You can see here on the slide on the left um, some of the key components of a just transition. Um, and I won't go through them in detail because of time, but the first is about institutionalising the concept. So how can we develop frameworks, um, plans so that we have co coherent and consistent messaging and implementation? Um, as I said, how can we look at distributive and procedural justice to make sure that both are included? How can we promote gender equality and economic inclusion as integral to climate action? Respect and promote decent jobs. Integrate social consensus into planning and implementation to create buy-in and accelerate transformational change. Um, the concept of meaningful participation and how we establish structures and relationships so that we really have meaningful participation. Um, Data-driven decision-making, um, so understanding potential impacts and doing enough upfront assessment work to help to make the right decisions at the right time. Cooperation and then tailoring solutions to national contexts. So the second key aspect I wanted to highlight, which is on the left of the slide, is the importance of understanding how just transition plays out across many different levels. You can see in the centre, it focuses on the project level. And when a particular project or activity or climate related program is implemented, at that level, there may be direct issues on jobs or local communities or suppliers. But it's also important to understand system level issues in terms of flow on effects out to the subnational level, the national level, and even the regional level. And particularly issues around compounding issues. So if we have multiple projects in one place or at one time, how will those projects interact with each other and perhaps have a multiplier effect that needs to be taken into account? I think another interesting aspect of just transition is that it brings a different set of stakeholders into the climate discussion. You know, within government, perhaps different ministries that traditionally haven't been at the forefront of making climate policy. So ministries like ministries of education, um, health, social ministries and youth and gender and making sure that they're a key, key part of the decision making process. And just to focus on youth, because I know that that's the particular interest of the, the topic. So, you know, I think youth participation in just transition is really, really key for a few reasons. As Bruno said, you know, most fundamental is that it's, it's youth's lives that are most threatened by climate change. And it's their future that we talk about when we talk about transformation and transition to a certain type of economy or society. They're also part of today's major economic sectors, construction, industry, waste management, transport. So how those sectors are going to transform will impact them and needs them as part of the process of decision making. So to make sure that youth are specifically considered in components, we need things like disaggregated data, um, tailored approaches, and taking a long-term time horizon to make sure that we look out to the impacts that they will feel for many years to come. I think youth also have a really interesting perspective to bring in terms of drivers of innovation. And that part I mentioned about taking the opportunities perspective of just transition, I think is where youth can really bring some interesting and exciting contributions. You know, promoting green entrepreneurship programs, equipping youth with the capacity to be involved in decision making and keeping processes youth centred will be really important. 
um, and understanding common constraints like limited access to information, limited capacity to access resources and to participate and how institutions like ADB take that into account as part of our process for developing a just transition framework and also applying that through our projects. And lastly, just to talk on the second part of your question in terms of Asia and Pacific. So definitely the early work on just transition in the climate space was certainly concentrated in Europe. And the EU established a just transition fund, which was mainly focused on support to coal mining regions and how to help those um, local communities and local economies adjust to moving away from mining. But having said that, it's now rapidly gaining momentum in Asia through all different types of stakeholders groups. Particularly in Asia, we have some, some big challenges. You know, it's a very diverse region with very different national contexts. Um, in a lot of uh, countries, we have very large populations. We have large informal workforce and a big youth population and issues around social protection, policies, future of education are really key. I think the dialogue has really picked up, but what we really need now is practical support and to keep working together to see what type of practical activities we can implement, how we can finance them to realise the concept that has really strong conceptual buy-in. Um, ADB is doing a lot of work on this um, and we're excited that soon we can launch a dedicated just transition support platform to provide um, resources to support this work in, in our developing member countries. Um, so with that, I hope that gave you a good introduction to the concept and I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you so much, Kate. It's really great to see how the concept has gradually evolved or transformed over time. It really encapsulates a common phrase that we use at PLAN, like leaving nobody behind as we move forward. And I'm sure we'll see today how this actually translates in practice across different sectors. So thank you so much again, Kate. I'm sure a lot of people in the audience uh, might have some questions, so don't forget that we have our pigeonhole live for these, and we'll get back to you after our speakers have presented. Thanks for reminding everyone, Simon. Now that we have a better understanding of what the Just Transition is and where we are as a region, let's move to the issue of jobs, green jobs in particular. Yeah, for this segment, let's bring in our expert, Felix Weidenka to discuss green economies in the region. So Felix works at the International Labor Organization in Bangkok as a regional youth employment specialist, where he provides advice on labor market policies and programs for youth. Welcome, Felix. Thank you for having me, Simon and Iris. Hi, Felix. Good to see you again. What we really want to know, given your vast experience in the sector, is what opportunities are there for young people in, in the green economy in Asia Pacific? And in your opinion, how can development actors help young people be meaningfully engaged in social dialogue? Thank you, Iris. And first of all, it's a pleasure for the International Labor Organization to, to join you today. Clearly, uh, environment, climate change, and employment are among the, the top concerns of today's generation of, of young people. And a just transition to green economies is also central to the work of, of the governments, employers, and workers' organizations in the Asia-Pacific region. And over the past two years, we all know that young people in Asia-Pacific were disproportionately affected by the impact of the COVID-19 crisis. And the recovery seems to remain fragile with the risks posed by the supply chain disruptions, the price spikes, financial distress, also geopolitical tensions. Now that said, even before the crisis, the region was facing both a youth employment crisis and an environmental crisis, which need to be tackled in a coordinated approach. So now is the time for many economies to initiate more long-term transformative changes. And let me share four points in response to your question from a labor market perspective for youth. First, it's important to raise awareness and engage young people and key stakeholders about the opportunities that exist in the green economy and green job opportunities. 
Many young people are aware of the environmental changes and also the need for a transition to a green economy. But the understanding and awareness of green jobs is often limited. And that has various reasons. Uh, the green economy includes a number of sectors, either directly or indirectly. For instance, natural resource-based sectors, such as agriculture, but also secondary sectors, such as the manufacture of green products and clean technology equipment, and tertiary sectors, such as sustainable transport. So measuring the size of the green economy or the number of green jobs is a difficult task, and not at least because of the data limitations and lack of uniform definitions. Um, but one takeaway for young people and policymakers alike is that green jobs are not limited to the environmental sector alone, but can be generated in any sector and any enterprise. Green jobs are decent jobs that contribute to preserve or restore the environment. So be they in traditional sectors such as manufacturing, construction, or in emerging green sectors such as renewable energy and energy efficiency. So at the enterprise level, you can imagine a green job to produce goods or, or provide services that benefit the environment, for example, clean transportation. But green jobs can also be jobs that contribute to more environmentally friendly processes, such as reduced water consumption. And the second point to highlight is that the transition to green economies in Asia Pacific can be an important generator of decent and productive employment opportunities for young people in the immediate recovery also from, from the crisis. And at the same time, it can contribute to environmental sustainability and inclusive structural transformation and economic diversification. The recent ILO analysis in the Global Employment Trends for Youth 2022 report shows that the targeted investments, not only in the green, but the blue, digital, creative, and care economies, they hold great potential to provide decent jobs for young people. So that analysis used a global macroeconometric model developed by Cambridge Econometrics to quantify the employment impacts of a package of green policy measures that were aimed at improving energy efficiency in buildings and appliances, decarbonizing electrical power generation through a shift to renewable energy, and also expanding electric vehicles usage and the associated infrastructure. Now, policy measures under this green scenario could create an additional net 8.4 million jobs worldwide for young people aged 15 to 29 years, relative to a, what, what you might call a business as usual scenario by 2030. But with Asia Pacific accounting for 5.8 million or almost 69% of those jobs. That said, and we, we all know these aggregate figure, they also mask em employment losses in some countries or in sectors and some groups of workers, as well as some jobs that are transforming or they're associated with changes in skills in some sectors. So it's important to keep in mind that policy measures need to be designed to ensure a just transition for all. For instance, investments in renewable energy infrastructure, such as wind power installations, they tend to benefit traditionally male dominated sectors, which also highlights the need to tackle gender barriers for young women in, in the labor market. And to conclude on this opportunities part, the positive trend of employment, for example, in the renewable energy sector is, is worth highlighting and also just confirmed again in the Re Renewable Energy and Jobs 2022 report, which showed that worldwide employment in renewable energy reached 12.7 million last year. So it's a jump of 700,000 new jobs in just one year, despite the crisis and also the growing energy uh, crisis. Now, and the third point from my side is to it needs coherent and well-coordinated policies to take advantage of these opportunities and to navigate a just transition to green economies. And the creation of green jobs for young people requires a wide array of policies and initiatives to be coordinated, even more so as the time and resources are limited. So these go from macroeconomic policy to agricultural and land reform policy, employment, skills, and social protection policies, the support for smaller enterprises so that they can develop and implement just transition plans and innovation policy, but also employment services and labor market policies will be critical in facilitating those job transitions. Regulatory changes will also play a central role, whether it's in terms of uh, green building codes or fishing regulations or the phase out of fossil fuel vehicles, and also in relation to incentivizing firms' investment in new climate-friendly technologies. 
overall, that means we need a new set of employment policies that promote both then a job rate recovery, but also a just transition to a green economy. So from the demand and supply side measures to instruments that support institutional strengthening. Just to give one concrete example, but for example, using carbon taxes to finance temporary reductions of social insurance contributions for companies that hire young people are a powerful means of creating a win-win situation for youth employment and the environment. Other measures that can have immediate implications for young people in the green economy are initiatives to enhance access to, micro, uh, to credit for micro, small and medium-sized enterprises in the green economy, or channeling green investments into sectors and in, in regions with a high share of youth unemployment, or, or green funds for entrepreneurship among young people, as well as skills anticipation efforts for, for green jobs among young people. Now, in addition, the, the choice of green technologies in policies will also, also shape the labor market opportunities for youth in developing countries, because the quantity and quality of jobs depend on them. So, but some of these technologies might not be easily accessible to developing countries or well suited to the context. So it also needs efforts to build the capacity to identify the appropriate technologies in the country context and deploy, adapt, and scale them up. And for youth to then seize the opportunities in, in the transition to a more environmentally sustainable economy, they need to be aware of what technologies underlie this transition. So what are the associated emerging occupations and what are the skills demanded by, by these occupations? So moving forward, these efforts can also get uh, further momentum through the Global Accelerator on Jobs and Social Protection for a Just Transition, which was launched by the UN Secretary General in 2021 and is also supported by the ILO. And this initiative seeks to support the creation of decent jobs, primarily in the green and care economies, and to extend social protection flaws to people currently not covered by any social protection. And my fourth and final point, development partners can actively support young people's meaningful engagement in social dialogue on a just transition. Efforts to create a more sustainable future cannot succeed if they fail to engage the younger generations meaningfully. And of course, any social consensus on sustainability pathways needs to be based on, on social dialogue and the meaningful involvement of, of young people, which will be different for each country. But this can be navigated through nationwide social dialogue between workers, employers, and governments. And ILO takes an active role in supporting these social dialogues across countries in the Asia Pacific region. Many young people are passionate about environmental issues and their work, and it's in essential to enhance the participation in decision making, including decisions on national plans for just transitions and to strengthen their capacity in it. To conclude from my side at this first step, a just transition towards environmentally sustainable economies and societies in Asia Pacific clearly opens up opportunities for productive employment and decent work for youth. And it also needs the meaningful engagement, the dynamism and innovative spirit to shape a better future work and achieve a greater and greener planet. Thank you. Thanks, Felix, for your insights today. So I've learned a lot there, but my key takeaways were, one, it's not just about the gloom and doom of climate change. We need to also know that there are opportunities brought about by climate action and the shift to a green economy. Um, and as young people and as stakeholders, we need to be aware of these and actively pursue them. But at the same time, we need the right policies to be in place, which anticipate potential losses um, and proactively create incentives for labor market actors um, and other stakeholders to pursue these new innovations and new practices. So I hope you're taking notes, everybody, because I sure am. I'm sure you also have your own questions. Um, but Simon? Yeah, I'm sure I have a lot as well. But hold on to your notes and questions as we still have two more speakers. So let's welcome our next speaker to provide some on the ground experience with young people themselves. That's right. 
Our next speaker is Rafid Shidki. Over the past five years, Rafid's, Rafid's career has revolved on developing community-based solutions to conserve endangered marine animals while simultaneously finding equitable approaches to safeguard the rights of local communities who depend on them. Currently, Rafid is working with the Asian Development Bank to mainstream the meaningful engagement of youth in climate resilience and adaptation initiatives in the Pacific. Thanks for joining us, Rafid. Thanks, Aries and Simon, for having me here. It's, it's an honor to be here. Thank you. We're happy to have you here, Rafid. And I'm sure a lot of people are dying to know what young people have done so far. Would you mind enlightening us on some youth-led initiatives that have demonstrated the impact of youth in the climate and disaster risk and reduction space? And why do you think it's important to ensure that youth are active contributors as we transition to a more sustainable future? Yeah, sure. Thank you very much, Simon, for the question. I think, uh, first of all, it's been an honor to represent the ADB Youth for Asia initiative um, on the Atoll Youth Climate Project. So um, I'm representing other CSOs and also the young people that we're working with uh, within the Atoll countries in this occasion. So just to give a little bit of context, um, we uh, from ADB Youth for Asia Initiative, we are implementing the Atoll Youth Climate Project um, that is funded by Ireland Trust Fund. Uh, and we are working in four uh, countries in the atolls, including the Maldives, Kiribati, Marshall Islands, and also Tuvalu. So in these four countries, just to give a little bit of context, uh, there are several uh, activities that we are doing uh, including the first one, uh, is that how the young people can involve in the youth-led climate risk assessment. So the aim of the youth-led climate risk assessment is actually to make the young people understand what is what is it uh, related to climate adaptation and mitigations that young people feel important in their lives um, and how they can understand what kind of uh, practical solutions to address them. And then from the climate risk assessment, uh, we move on to the next activity, which is the capacity building for young people, where uh, the youth from these four atoll countries can design the meaningful climate adaptation and mitigation projects within their communities. And eventually they will receive uh, small scale funding from the ADB uh, to implement the project uh, as part of the uh, innovation project demonstrations. So I think that the main framework that ADB Youth for Asia Initiative um, is implementing is the meaningful youth engagement, meaning that the young people from these four atoll countries are participating from the start until the end of the project cycle. So they help to design the project. They have to um, involve in the stakeholder engagement, not only with other youth, but also with uh, adult members, for example, the government, uh, the NGO leaders, community leaders, and some other stakeholders that you know uh, that can foster the meaningful collaboration between the young people and the adults. Um, and part of the uh, activities that we have implemented is the uh, selecting uh, multiple projects uh, from the four atoll countries that are fall under the climate adaptation and mitigation. So I can take an example for, um, in the Maldives, um, people. Uh, implementing the projects that is focused first is on the awareness on the importance of marine ecosystems um, to the climate adaptation and also mitigation. Uh, as you may have known that uh, for atoll countries, the ocean resources uh, are the most important part in their lives. So they depend on fisheries, um, they depend on tourism, uh, marine tourism more specifics, uh, and also they depend on the sustainability of marine ecosystems in general. But they felt that um, not all, uh, especially youth who are in the outer part of the islands, um, understand the importance of these ecosystems. So they created an awareness uh, program and also creating a book, storybook that is interactive for young people starting from the elementary school until middle school. So they can learn about coral reefs, um, they can learn about um, seagrasses. Uh, and other marine ecosystems that plays in the climate adaptation and mitigation. The second projects that are from the Maldives, for example, in uh, one um, island chain in Gakondi uh, and also Ga Nilandu, 
So they implementing projects related to waste management uh, because they feel uh, in small islands, especially uh, there, there has been no um, uh, system for waste management. So most people just throw the waste to the ocean or they burn uh, the waste um, you know, with, with fire and everything. And then uh, it actually in, in, impacted the health uh, of the communities living in the island, uh, especially related to you know, lung problems because the, the fogs uh, and also the, um, the burning of the plastics uh, is really harmful to their health, particularly to the young people. Um, and they wanted to change that. Uh, and, and especially, I think, burning the, the plastic um, causing the pollution that uh, eventually increased the greenhouse gas emissions. So the young people in the Maldives, uh, in Gakondi and also in Ganilandu, uh, they wanted to make the communities aware and also they wanted to create where, um, uh, especially citizens, they will not be burning trash anymore because it brings uh, bad health impacts. Um, in contrast, I think um, even if the... Uh, the Maldives experiences um, quite similar with the Pacific. So, for example, in Tuvalu and Kiribati, um, they feel the same way, especially related to the climate impacts. Um, but if the Maldives feel, you know, waste management are important, uh, in Tuvalu and Kiribati, water security, particularly, and also food security, uh, are the top um, issues that they have identified, uh, mainly because people in Tuvalu um, are depending on. Uh, foods uh, that are that were imported from other countries, um, and it's it's really dependent on the season and when the climate um, situations are not very well. Um, it impacted the uh, you know the availability of foods, uh, so they experience food shortage and also uh, water security. So they feel that uh, in order to increase the um, the food resilience of the local communities, uh, they need to uh, create you know, a locally sourced foods, but at the same time, um, with the limited land for agriculture, um, they feel some limitations as well. So they wanted to create, for example, the greenhouse um, to plant some of the homegrown vegetables um, and also created uh, some water catchment. Uh, so during the rain, they can preserve more water um, so they will not be experiencing some water shortage. Um, and I think the other cool projects that youth are leading, uh, for example, in the Marshall Islands and Kiribati, um, uh, same still with the water security issues. Uh, so people in Marshall Islands, especially the young people, so this is the cool thing. Um, so the high school students um, under the College of Marshall Islands, they actually created a solar uh, powered desalinator. So it's a very simple device um, where uh, they transform salt water into fresh water with a very low cost um, and they can develop in their own home. Um, so it's one of the innovations that the youth are currently leading with the guidance of the civil society organizations that we're working with, for example, the College of Marshall Islands and also the Kiribati uh, Climate Action Network. Uh, so these two initiatives, um, especially in Tuvalu and in Kiribati, um, it's very important because uh, Many of these uh, communities are living separated from the main island, especially those who are living in the outer islands. They have limited access to the uh, to communications and informations, and it impacting on the um, you know uh, on, on the way they respond to the challenges. And especially when it comes to water security and food security, uh, because the islands located uh, very far away, it's remote. Uh, it is very important to make sure that the communities can survive um, by providing. Uh, some devices that actually uh, could support them. So for example, the initiative from the youth in the Marshall Islands, they created a device that is actually um, can be built anywhere and they are looking for, uh, you know, scaling up to other different communities, especially those who have not been reached by any development projects. Um, and I think that, you know, the Atelier Climate Project has been very inspiring so far um, because they mentioned several times, like, yes, as a young people, they really care about their future uh, and the climate change is impacting their future. Um, especially it gives them some anxiety uh, related to whether, whether or not they will survive in the future um, with the, you know, with the sea level rise, with the limited um, land for a living, the homelessness, the increasing of homelessness, but at the same time, they actually have the drive and passion. I think it just resonates um, what 
uh, Kate um, and also Felix have been talking about that the young people have the passion and the drive. And the um, important thing is that how to push the young people to participate in the climate adaptation and mitigation and to provide a right platform, giving them the right experiences, um, giving them enough awareness, and importantly, is the financial support so they can directly, um, you know, uh, implementing the ideas that they have and meaningfully collaborate with other um, adult members in the country. So, for example, with the government and with the NGOs. And I think that's how the young people can be meaningfully engaged um, and how their idea could be accounted for the just transition for the greener economies because it supports livelihoods, uh, it supports their future and, uh, and other uh, food security, water security, and other aspects um, that are important for their lives. Thank you, Rafi. That was, that was a lot. Um, I really appreciate that the examples that you shared about young people connecting communities, hard to reach communities to these local solutions, to issues that they themselves consider to be most important. But I also particularly appreciated how you helped us unpack the idea of meaningful youth engagement. So in this particular context, um, thank you for describing what a meaningful youth engagement is. It's, it's about, connect, about providing funding, providing a platform, and providing knowledge and awareness of issues for young people, but at the same time, enabling them to partner with adult stakeholders and involving them throughout the project cycle so that they're able to also provide significant input into the project um, and make it more relevant to the local context. I thought that was great. Um, Simon? That's a good point, Iris. Um, our next speaker actually will be speaking on more of this, and she will be speaking on gender transformative green education and how this can be utilized in a just transition. So, without further ado, we'd like to invite our next speaker, Salia Suarez. Salia is the project coordinator for the Climate Change Adaptation in Plan International Timor Leste. She holds a bachelor's in environmental engineering and has a published paper. Uh, for the Journal of Environmental Engineering and Waste Management on Population Growth and Water Demands in Comoros Zone 1, Timor-Leste. Talk about green education. So welcome, Talia. Hello, Simon. Hello, Iris. Thank you for having me. Hi, Talia. It's nice to see you today. Uh, we've been talking a lot about, you know, the Just Transition and the different approaches to this. What is Plan Timor-Leste's approach to this same topic, and, and why do you think it's important for us to prioritize green, gender transformative green education in the midst of all these changes? Thank you, Iris, for these questions. Uh, okay, so Plan International have been working in Timor Leste since 2000, which has three country programs. The first one, gender equality and growth empowerment, second, early child childhood development, and third is the disaster uh, risk re reduction and climate change adaptation. So in program three, we focus on addressing the climate change through enhancing the child-centered community resilience and disaster preparedness. So on this part, we focus uh, working with schools and village councils to engage in sustainable use of natural resources and disaster risk mapping. Timor Leste is considered as one of the most um, climate vulnerable countries in the world and is ranked as having the 10th highest risk rating on the World Risk Index. And it's, the nation's already prone to earthquakes, tsunamis, cyclones, heavy rainfall and droughts. And with this climate vulnerability is worsened by high exposure and low coping capacities due to a combination of high poverty rates, high dependence on climate sensitive livelihoods, and increasing environmental degradation, as well as limited institutional capacity, technology, and infrastructure. So there are some obstacles that we have in Timor Leste. Many local so uh, civil society organizations in Timor Leste still have the minimal capacity in CCA and DOR, especially in integrating this topic into mainstream development programs. And communities, including women, children, and other uh, marginalized groups 
often do not have opportunities to participate and influence decisions or hold the government accountable in addressing the issues of climate change and disaster risk. And the coordination programs between sub-national government actors, the private sector and academy are often limited so the intergovernmental uh, coordination between national and municipal level is still weak, particularly in climate change. So what ten approaches are, so we work with local NGO um, that's been implemented a three-year project to support local civil society organizations and governments in effectively addressing climate change. So this project has been funded by the European Union. The overall objective of this project is to enable Timorians CSOs to actively promote activities and policies that are gender sensitive and socially inclusive to prepare for and respond to the impacts of climate change in Timor-Leste. So overall, we've trained the CSOs on the climate change impact. We've also worked with the um, uh, vulnerable groups to give awareness of the CC uh, climate change effects and developed and implement local level climate smart responses and adaptive actions. We've also involved working with the school children because as we all know that children are the future leaders of this world. So it's important to involve them, including girls and children with disabilities in the CCA action and advocacy. And we've also created a good relationship, a good cooperation with the government and other relevant uh, stakeholders to inform the CCA policy development and decision making that is gender sensitive and socially inclusive. So with many trainings that's been given to the CSOs, uh, several CSOs have strengthened their capacity to prepare for and respond to the impacts of climate change in Timor-Leste. So far, we have achieved 29 CSOs in 13 municipalities of Timor-Leste and 15 out of 29 CSOs have implemented the DOR and CCA in the programs, which is great because this will help to disseminate the CCA awareness in the broader region, especially in the remote areas. And we've also produced the CCA curriculum manuals for uh, grade seven and teachers. This is one of the most uh, accom biggest accomplishments we received from this project because it's being approved by the Minister of Education. Not only this, but we've also uh, created a really good relationship with the Minister of Education, um, um, Civil Protection, Secretary of State for the Environment, and other relevant stakeholders as well. So this manual is being given out to uh, national trainers and teachers of two municipalities to integrate these manuals into their school curriculum. So this curriculum has been delivered to Minister of Education to integrate other schools so that teachers and uh, children can have access to these uh, sources. And uh, currently we're developing policies in education sector on climate change and DOR working with the UNICEF. And at the end of this year, we will send the draft to the Minister of Education for revision. And um, Timor-Leste is also a young country with a population of 1.3 million people, with nearly half of the population with being under 18 years of age, and yet there is still insufficient attention to gender. Gender inequality in Timor-Leste is still high due to patriarchal system in the country, especially in the remote areas where um, they feel like men are more in power in the society, more men men are more um, involved in the decision making, which leads to higher vulnerability of women and girls in the changing climate. And this can, have, this can also perpetuate uh, or even aggravate gender inequalities. And we all know that girls and women do have the abilities to contribute to adaptation efforts. And Plan International does recognize that girls and women in Timor Leste are are disproportionately affected by the impacts of climate change, which further have a negative impact on girls' access to education, uh, which leads to a high number of school, uh, school dropouts because they feel like it's their responsibility to take care of the households and family. And some parents may force their kids to get married so then the, the guy can actually sustain financial, financial issues. And another thing is water scarcity due to floods. And this also have an impact on girls and women because they have no access to manage hygiene needs. 
So girls and women are more vulnerable to climate change and they are less likely to be empowered to cope, to cope with due to access to fewer resources. Thus, it's important to work with relevant stakeholders to give awareness raising of gender inequalities to increase girls' and women's inclusion and empowerment, and also to engage with boys and young men to promote gender equalities, because they also play a vital role in this process as well, not only for girls. So it's important to engage young, um, it's important to engage boys and young men to promote gender equalities and to integrate gender considerations in all initiatives addressing climate change in Timor-Leste to ensure their success and sustainability so that they do not inadvertently reinforce existing inequalities and power structures. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, Iris. That's it for me. Wow, that's an amazing approach, Talia. Thank you for sharing with us. We talked earlier about the importance of effective partnership in a just transition. And I think your initiative really highlights the benefits of tapping the right stakeholders in a just transition. But what I really appreciated was that aside from partnering with government, you worked with teachers and students, especially girls and young women in developing your policies and your curriculums even. And I think it doesn't even stop with what you've created. It's just the beginning. And in a just transition, it's no longer just the responsibility of the energy sector, like Kate mentioned a while ago, but it's all our issues, especially ensuring that girls and young women are not left behind. But what do you think, Iris? I agree with that. But my takeaway was the role of the curricula itself. So uh, Felix was talking about the importance of knowing what the opportunities are, including what green jobs are available for young people to pursue. And I think we have to start a little bit earlier than when young people actually be, enter the age of youthhood. Um, by putting green education in the system, in the education system, while, young, while they are still growing up from, from grade school all the way up to maybe secondary and in other, in other um just even in training centers, we're able to equip them with the knowledge and maybe a little bit more understanding of what the green economy might mean for them um, and how they might pursue these opportunities. So I think that's a very concrete way of actually um, taking Felix's insight on knowledge, knowing what opportunities are in the mar labor market and, and pursuing them. Um, so thanks again, Talia. That was a very interesting um, example. Um, Simon? Yeah, that was a lot. And I think definitely learned a lot from our speakers. Now we can see all the linkages between Kate's presentation and now Felix's presentation to Rafid, and then eventually Thalia's as well. So why don't we invite all of them back in? All right. Uh, welcome Hello, back, everyone. everybody. Welcome back. Um, thanks again for joining us today. I'm sure you're excited to hear about each other's experiences um, and to also answer the questions that the audience has started leaving for you on Pigeon Hall. That's true. And before we continue, I hope you're all ready for your questions over there in the audience. Again, we have them up and running over at pigeonhall.at using the passcode ADB. MNL 55. So keep your questions coming and we'll be there shortly. I can see them already in my screen. Iris, do you have our first question? I do. And our first question goes for everyone, but goes to everyone. But I'd like to call Rafid first, if that's okay. Um, Rafid, the first question is, how can we empower young people in rural communities who have no access to information technology and who lack financial support? Yeah, thank you, Aris, for the question. I think um, this is particularly important also uh, when we work in the atoll countries uh, because we are aiming to engage as many vulnerable youth as possible, those who are living uh, outside of the capital, uh, and especially those who are living in the outer islands They don't have that much access to information, and internet is really expensive. Um, and one way uh, 
we actually work with the uh, civil society organizations because they understand better, you know, with the um, logistics, with the, uh, you know, the best approach to engage young people. The first one is to ensure that the um, young people can uh, have access to internet uh, by first is that mobilizing them to an area uh, that is accessible with internet and then providing them supports with transportation um, and also with, you know, some uh, additional logistics uh, so they can participate in every activities that we are doing on the ground. Um, and I think on, on the practical note is that um, if, because uh, when we work with the rural communities, especially in the outer islands, uh, transportation become one of the biggest um, costs uh, for engaging them um, and ensuring that, uh, you know, every financial supports uh, related to projects um, should be there um, to make sure that, you know, um, transportation could be supported and they can be mobilized uh, effectively uh, in the activities. And importantly, on the, on the, I think this is also mentioned by the youth themselves that they need a development of a tower for internet um, in their island. So they, you know, um, they can uh, rely on that uh, to accessing uh, for information uh, and they, you know, they can have a more accessible internet that is not too expensive because uh, especially in the Pacific internet is really um, high cost, um, especially when they wanted to uh, access information on climate change uh, and participate on youth related programs that um, that we are doing uh, at Youth for Asia. So yeah, hopefully that answers the question. <laughs> Thanks, Rafid. Um, I want to reframe this same question a little bit for Felix, um, focusing a little bit on the labor market. So Felix, same question, but more on how do young people in rural communities access training and um, employment opportunities in the green economy when they don't have access to to IT, to, to the internet, or may not have the means to, to participate? opportunities actually for, for greening economy lie also in the rural economy and with regard to the sectors that are that are relevant to it or that are reliant on 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 water, whether it's agriculture or fisheries or, or other important sectors that even though structural transformation has advanced and we've seen a shift also of young people's job opportunities from agriculture in, into industry in services across the Asia Pacific region over the past decades, but agriculture still remains also in rural areas and a key sector for young people. So the point made about the, the lack of access to information technology or lack of financial support is an important one, not only for the for the green economy, but just for, for economic and labor market opportunities for youth in the rural economy as such. So I think it needs to be key for, for governments and other stakeholders in the countries to improve young people's access to productive resources in the first place. So that's within and beyond agriculture. And because ensuring access to productive resources means also it's, that helps to attract young people to rural activities, especially in agriculture. It means also um, potential to increase productivity, um, also with potential for in increased income opportunities. So we, we know that there's a lack of, not only lack of information technology of or lack of financial support, but there's lack of other productive um, assets or ownership in terms, for example, land or, or, or financial capital and, and other aspects. So, one, oh, so this means we'll need an increased investments into young people's futures in, in the rural economy. There, just to pick on, on one step here is I think on the, on the skills development here, um, because also technology was, was brought up. Um, early as well, and, and education in that regard, depending on the context and what 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 suits the rural context, there are different also low cost or, or technologies available also for for the green economies that can be that can be adapted. So it's about identifying the right technologies that that can be deployed, and also then providing the skills or embedding them early in the education and training system, including in in the in the TVET system. And there, there are various uh, also innovative practices that we've seen in terms of increasing training efficiency, um, what, what some countries have done or how they've promoted more efficient um, agribusinesses through, through the, the right skills um, initiatives early, early on. So I think that would be a key, 
key measure um, to to look into more more specifically. And uh, I saw there was another question later on specifically on on skills. So I'm not going to go into more details on this for now. Thank you. Thank you, Felix. So look at low tech solutions, but also let's not forget one of the biggest sectors um, in the green economy is actually in rural, um, in rural spaces. So thank you, Felix. Um, Simon? Yes, so I am looking at the pigeonhole. So thank you again, Felix. But I think looking at the time, we still have some time to answer more questions. And I wanted to invite um, Kate, because a while ago we had a lot of discussion on what a just transition really is. And I think there was a question here about what is ADB doing to ensure that young people are involved towards influencing climate change and greener economy aspects into their development projects. Sure, sure. Thanks, Simon, um, for the question. So I think if we look at what ADB is doing, we can think of it from two perspectives. So the first is targeted youth programs like, you know, Youth for Asia that Rafiq's described in detail. The other perspective is how we integrate the views and needs of youth as key stakeholders in the design of all projects. Um, I think there's probably three stages that you can think about. The first is upfront assessment, right, in terms of the work that's done to design projects, to identify the need for project and work out the best solution and how youth's perspective can be brought into that. So as I mentioned, that includes things like disaggregated data that use looks specifically at youth, uh, their challenges and impacts. Also, you know, we employ things like futures thinking coming in more into to the work that we're doing so that we look at that long term time horizon and think about what futures scenarios may look like. Um, and how we take account of things like um, from just transition perspective, how we take account of things like family structures how um, impacts of things like lost jobs might filter down to other family members um, and future opportunities and make sure as part of that assessment process that specifically youth is there. I think the second is on consultation and we've talked a lot about meaningful participation and heard some really good examples so I won't go on to that too much but you know how you make sure youth have access to the consultation how you balance the fact that they need to be an equal stakeholder in broad consultation, but then also have specific youth-focused consultation so that you give both opportunities for them to be at the bigger table and then have the environment that's tailored specifically to, to their needs and their type of participation. And then lastly, in the design. And I think it's really important to look at parallel processes. So a lot of the Just Transition work needs to deal with the immediate impacts that are going to happen, right? So if you're going to have lost jobs, if you're going to have impacts on communities. But it's essential at the same time that we look at the longer term things. So we're doing a lot of work in parallel on things like future of education systems. Um, so not just immediate reskilling, but long term curricula at universities, how that can be adjusted to look at the new futures, new types of jobs and also work around economic diversification. So if we know that certain regions or certain industries may be impacted, what type of enabling support can we do now to create future opportunities? So I think if those parallel processes of the longer term structural changes that need to happen and more transformational changes are undertaken at the same time as dealing with the immediate shorter term impacts, then that um, will integrate the needs of use more into the design as the, those that will be in the longer term timescape. Thanks. Thank you so much, Kate. And I think this goes back really to Iris's point a while ago as well on how we really start with education and the fact that we are integrating them and using the data to actually drive our programs and even our educational curriculums. And speaking of education, since we have a little bit more time, I'll pass on to Iris for one last question. 
Thank you, Simon. Actually, this is for Talia. Um, the audience members want to know, the green education curriculum that you talked about, is this already being implemented nationwide? Are there dedicated subjects already? Can you tell us more? We've been working on for two years. Oh, sorry. So we've been working on this curriculum for two years and uh, it was being approved recently in 2021, in November. So that was a huge accomplishment for this uh, project. And um, with, from, before this curriculum, we worked with the relevant stakeholders, spe specifically with the Minister of Education. And um, um, so then we can provide uh, trainers to the national trainers. So then they can pass on the training to um, um, the municipal teachers in the rural areas. And so far, we've achieved uh, two successful training to uh, um, municipal municipalities. And um, this curriculum has been uh, uh, delivered to Ministry of Education uh, at the national level. So they will uh, they will they will deliver this to all schools in General Leste. So then um, teachers can have access to this curriculum, and then they can implement it in their uh, school curriculum, as well as for uh, students to access in there from the libraries so then they can know more about this uh, climate change awareness in Timor-Leste as well. So yeah, this curriculum is, it's, it's at national level right now because it's officially being approved by the Ministry of Education. And, um, sorry, and we've, uh, we're trying to work on um, by producing the curriculum for grade eight in the future term. So hopefully that will be another successful Thank you. Thank you, Talia. Um, thanks for giving us more information about that. Um, I'm going to give this back to Simon for next steps. Yes. So thank you so much again for everyone. But unfortunately, this is all the time we have for our question and answer. And I wish to thank each and every one of you for participating and really sharing what you know and what you've experienced in the in this field and in this topic as well. Um, so for Iris, I'll give it back to you. <laughs> Thanks so much. And thank you, Kate, Felix, Rafid, and Talia. This is as far as Simon and I go for today's session. It has been a pleasure to talk to you today. Okay, so we, um, do we okay, have more sorry, time for then discussion? we actually, yes, we do actually have time then. Okay. In that case, I want to call back Felix. Um, one of the questions from the pigeonhole is more about short cur courses, short term courses, which can be very helpful for future job prospects. Can you share any learnings from, from ILO's work in the region about how these kinds of courses can be developed for? Um, developing economies. Thank you, Iris. I, I think from what we see in the region, but also globally, is that there's increasing demand for shorter training courses. Also, what young people see as the returns they get quickly on some new set of skills that they consider relevant to the to the labor market. I think there are a couple of, or whether it's short-term ter training courses or micro credentials. Um, there are, of course, some important aspects to it in terms of to what extent are some of those um, courses um, meet quality criteria? To what extent are they certified or also recognized by both government and, and employers? Also, what happens if you if you move to another country? Is there a recognition of some of those prior learning um, components? But I think an, an interesting aspect and in developments what we are seeing in the region is the integration of greening aspects, including in shorter courses in the technical vocational training um, institutes. That's that's a process the ILO is actively supporting together with industry and employer partners, with training institutes, with the government authorities, because essentially it means beyond the, let's say, greening processes at enterprise level and some of the more broader economy economic processes that, that have been mentioned already in this session, it's important that young people are equipped with the green skills. So, so and that means also changing the way skills are delivered and what content, how the content is framed in TVET institutes. So that actually involves revising the competency standards, 
for certain occupations to green them to understand also how to green the curricula so and that's a process that that takes time and that that will continue um uh, for some time in, gradually also as the institutions adapt and accelerate that um that process the second point i would like to make is of course those relate to technical skills in the in the tvet institutes but more than that i think it's key also that we look at greening also from an from a core skills perspective or others might call it uh, life skills so the ilo has actually a global framework on 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 core skills and the basic skills for green jobs are, are, are considered part of that so every young person in the future should also have some basic skills um, and that are that they're equipped with before they enter the labor market so that includes environmental awareness or certain aspects about waste reduction and waste management um, as well as energy and, and water efficiency. And it will be up to us, of course, governments and um, education and training institutes, how to embed those basic green skills early on in the education system. So that young people actually, not only with re in relation to the labor market, but for life as such, are equipped with the right um, green skills and, and green life skills as well. Thank you. Thank you, Felix. Um, Kate, I wanted to take this to you next. So Felix was talking about um, TVET revisions in the TVET system and promoting um, green skills at the, at the, in, the, in, the training, in the training system. You were talking about parallel, um, parallel interventions a while ago in, in one of the questions. And I wanted to ask, um, how do ADB investments fall, come, into, come into play in, in a situation where we're trying to transform education and training systems in anticipation of this, this, this green economy? Sure. Um, I think one of the big evolutions that we've seen as we work more and more on the topic of just transition is the need to bring together action in different sectors, right? So a lot of um, social sector support that ADB gives um, a lot of dialogue with government, with other stakeholders in social sectors, so education, health, has been conducted somewhat separate sometimes to the climate and you know, support on energy or decarbonisation of transport systems. So it's really important to start to bring those together um, and see, for example, how ADB's strong support in some of those sectors like education and health could potentially be mobilised in alignment with some of the support for things like energy transition. So how can we look at um, education projects that can mutually benefit in countries that are going under a big energy transition or sectors where we are, are looking at a project that will promote change? Um, so, and then I think in the same way, it's about supporting governments to also have that cross-government coordination and discussion. So when policy is being made for us, you know, when climate policy is being made or when energy policy is being made, um, that, that also takes into account policy in other sectors. So what's the education policy in the country? What type of work is being done? Um, also on research, right? You know, there's a lot of in research and a lot of analysis on future of education, future skills needed, and is that research informing the decision-making process for climate policy? Um, so I think cooperation and a multi-dimensional approach is really essential for just transition because it brings those social and economic dimensions into the climate policy decision-making. Thank you, Kate. I think this also reinforces um, DG Bruno's earlier lesson on collaboration, actually, and how if you have awareness and you have collaboration, you're able to drive this transformation that we're trying to strive at. Thank you, Felix, and thank you, Kate. Um, Simon, I think, has a question also for Rafi Dantalia. Yes. So actually, now that we're talking about awareness, we do have one question in the pigeon hole. So they mentioned that now that we have a better understanding of what a just transition is, um, how can young people who are interested in these projects and initiatives um, reach out or what are the opportunities that are available? So I wanted to ask Rafid first, like, how would 
young people who have now this profound knowledge on just transition participate in it? Yeah, uh, thank you, Simon. Uh, I think that if the, if we put a context of uh, ADB Youth for Asia project on the Atulis Climate Project in particular, um, it's still kind of like regionally um, limited. It's only focused on four uh, different countries in the Maldives, uh, Kiribati, Marshall Islands, and also Tuvalu. Um, but we did actually open the opportunities for every young people who are interested to take part uh, in the project, especially in the beginning, in the middle, um, and right now in the implementation of climate innovation projects. Um, and they, uh, because we, we work closely with the uh, CSO in these four ATO countries, um, the CSO actually helped to facilitate um, the youth, uh, especially those who, you know, who are interested, they can reach out to the CSO and then CSO connected to us uh, at ADB Youth for Asia. So for example, uh, we actually recruited the uh, youth as the local ambassadors, those who are, you know, leading the um, project design, implementation, and also um, networking with the local stakeholders. Um, and in the middle, sometimes the local ambassadors also recruiting at their youth members who are interested. So um, there's always um, an opportunity for the young people to participate in every part of the uh, project cycle in the Atoll Youth Climate Project. Um, and I think uh, maybe in, in the coming opportunities, perhaps ADB Youth for Asia will have other projects that focus in different countries. We, we do actually like, you know, because it's only four different countries, sometimes we have registrants from say Afghanistan uh, and even Kenya. Um, even if like, you know, we, we, we say that, oh, we actually only recruited participants from at all countries, but um, there's always, you know, a lot of applications coming in from other countries like in Pakistan as well and um, other Asia Pacific and even Africa sometimes they, um, you know, applied for uh, this opportunity. So I think it, it's just giving the, um, the the sign that, you know, there's a lot of young people who are interested to participate in, um, you know, in, in green economies and they just looking for the right opportunities for them. And um, I think it will be uh, amazing if there are more opportunities like this for them to participate. Thank you so much, Rafid. And I know that there's a lot of opportunities now, and hopefully young people are able to tap into that. And now I want to, for one last time, to bring back Talia, because a while ago you mentioned working with government and specifically the teachers and the students. So how can, for example, projects like these enable or empower young leaders, specifically those girls and young women who are in the more vulnerable areas to actually be empowered and participate in this as well from your experience okay thank you Simon. For, so whenever we do like a socialization or so given our trainings of the climate change impact most of the uh, we get like a lot of uh, uh, youngsters from the participants that were more active in that socialization and training. So they tried to reach out to us and like, when are you guys going to do the next trainings or the next activities because we would like to uh, participate in that. So it was kind of interesting to, uh, that we got this feedbacks and we got this result from the participants, especially the young youngsters one, because it shows that they were willing to they were willing to learn more of the climate change itself, and it's it's it, it was it was interesting and and when we uh, give our trainings for the CSOs, um, most of the participants were youngsters, and they also passed on this um, this message of the curriculum. Uh, the CCA awareness and the curriculums, um, they actually passed on this message to other CSOs, and then other CSOs actually reached out to us if they could participate in this training. So it was it was kind of interesting that because our messages actually influenced other uh, civil society organizations. So um, that was a great um, opportunity as well because we got to um, get to know them as well and. Also, to implement this curriculum, it was a it was a long process, but overall, we've achieved um, so many things from this project. And one of these is the curriculum, and hopefully, that uh, we will continue to achieve this accomplishment in it um, in the future as well. Thank you, Simon. 
Thank you so much, Talia. And I think there's no better way to close our session than that. It's a lot of hope and a lot of inspiration that young people themselves are the ones who want to lead in this movement. So I'd like to say thank you again to each and every one of you for all the feedback and all the insights that you shared with us. Iris? Yeah, and this time for sure. Um, one more uh, one more round of appreciation to Kate, Felix, Rafid, and Talia for being flexible with this additional round of questions. We really appreciate that learning from all of you and bringing your own expertise in the matter. This is it for Simon and myself. Uh, we hope you had a great afternoon because we definitely did. Um, we found this to be very informative and inspiring. Um, so handing this back to you, Simon. Yes. So now to close our session, may I now invite the head of ADB's NGO and Civil Society Center, Heidi Irdeport, for some final words. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, Iris. And thank you to all the speakers for a wonderful session today. Um, I'm very pleased to see how you structure this event. It's very well organized from Kate speaking on the Just Transition Framework, what it includes. We actually learned a little bit about the history of the Just Transition word, how it was coined by the unions in the US and, and how the work started with the coal mining groups, but now it's extended and expanded. And I think it's really exciting to, to, to learn about the framework and to have that picture that Kate showed on the slide stay with us of all the different dimensions of Just Transition and, uh, and, and how young people can actually uh, engage in the various aspects, the very parts, various parts of the, the, the cycle and, and the processes. Um, and that in a way, young people's lives are, are most affected by climate change and the transition to the new economy and how should they play a part in it. And, uh, and also youth are seen as a, an innovation for a driver for innovation so with the right access to information, the right, um, uh, I think, capacity building and training, uh, youth can actually engage right now as a part of the process. And then Felix, with his uh, um, uh, presentation on green jobs, um, has uh, shared with us that it's, it's very important to think that it's green jobs are not limited to just environmental sector alone. But we can think of green job as jobs that are socially beneficial to, to people to earn a, a decent uh, livelihood and, and have good income and, and take care of their family. And then he presented the, the report. Actually, it would be good to, to take time after this event to read the ILO report on um, the jobs creation in the green economy and, and how young people can take advantage of, of the new economy. Um, I think the importance of policy and coordination of the, the, the various different kinds of policies by government uh, considering their context is, is very important. So the policy climate, um, as well as the, the, the access to information for young people to learn about where the economy is going and how can they take advantage of, of the, uh, the jobs being created and, and where are the sector that the jobs are growing and where is the job uh, shrinking. So, so it's good for young people to stay aware of that and 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 keep on learning about the the changing and the transition we see in the economy and then the role the important role of, of partners development partners to engage young people in meaningful uh discussions such as the one we're having today and then we transition into uh two two examples of how young people are already engaging in this space uh, one is the Youth for Asia programs that ADB has been uh, investing in for the past 10 years and the role that young people can play in their community to bring about uh, climate resilience and, and preparing themselves for what's to come with respect to the changes that will happen in their communities. And, uh, and I think uh, the, the four countries highlighted by Rafid, um, Tuvalu, Kiribati, uh, Marshall Islands, and uh, the Maldives are, are very sensitive atolls countries um, that is already uh, um, seeing the changes of, of climate um, uh, impacts right now. And so the young people are actively taking parts in their community and finding the solutions. And, and last, we had Talia's discussion of how the role of gender is very important to consider. 
and uh, and the young people uh, and young and old uh, uh, women and girls, and also the, the greater community can can work to support uh, the the transition so that um, there is a role for uh, for uh, women and girls to play, and then and then we should be more sensitive about some of the programs um, uh, that needs to be addressed. Um, in certain countries, particularly in Timor Leste, um, where where she highlighted the work that Plan is is doing with uh, empowering women uh, for climate resilience work there, um, I, I think these are really fascinating. I really love hearing about grassroots works and then linking that to what the policy contexts are. And I think this this discussion has been very rich, and I look forward to learning more from young people. Uh, ADB definitely are looking at how we can target our support to young people and make it very focused to, to what's meaningful for young people today. And I look forward to engaging more with all of you um, going forward on how ADB can, can strengthen and support um, the work for Just Transition. So thank you very much. I hope you all have a good weekend tomorrow, Saturday. So um, enjoy yourself. It's been a long week. So with that, I thank you um, and have a good, good day, good rest of the day.